if it's used properly, it's, it's an incredibly powerful tool. Hello, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, it's Dr. Jim Hoven at Ramos Law for the Ramos Law Difference Makers podcast. And today is another opportunity for us to talk to one of our own who's making a difference. You've heard him before. This is Dr. Don Cooper. And today we're going to talk about something completely different than we've ever shared before on the show. And this is one of those things that, depending on your view, is one of the most exciting turns of technology we've ever seen in the history of our species, or it's something that could lead us to ultimate destruction. So it just depends on what happens, how it goes, and what we choose to do with it. What are we talking about? Well, of course, artificial intelligence or AI. And so Dr. Cooper has his hands all over this stuff. And we just wanted to share that with you today, talk about it. And I'm sure it's going to raise lots of questions. This is one that uh, when reality meets sci-fi, we're here in that moment right now. So we're at some pretty pivotal times. And so this is one, once you listen, I'm sure it'll bring thoughts to your mind. It might even make you go like, oh crap, we're in big trouble. Or you might say, man, this is the, the saving of our planet and our people. So uh, you're gonna wanna share this, listen to it a couple of times and send us lots of engagement and comments on this so that we can see how to make this better for you next time. So without further ado, Dr. Don Cooper. Dr. Don, welcome back yet again. Thank you, it's uh, good to be here. Oh man, listen, I'm so psyched for this. We talked about this. We've had a half hour warm up on this before we even started taping because it's just so fascinating. It's everywhere. Like yeah. literally within the last two weeks, there was a big 60 minute show even on mm -hmm. this concept of artificial intelligence, who's doing what, how it works, the problems, the, the potentials, the shortfall mm -hmm. or the shortfalls, pitfalls. So I wanted to see if we can deconstruct that for our audience. Sure. First talking about what artificial intelligence is, and then we'll kind of go down the path from there. So can you just describe AI from your perspective as a neuroscientist? Sure. Um, Artificial intelligence is a, a system, well, the way it is right now with, let's say, the large language models, which is the one everyone's talking about is ChatGPT. And large language, can you define what a large language model is? Sure. These are, these are models that use human language or natural language to uh, perform statistical operations on. And um, using probability distributions, they, they predict what um, if, if given a prompt, um, it predicts what the response should be, what the best response is. And these models are trained up on massive amounts of data. So in order for these things to work, they have to be trained up basically, I would say on the entirety of the, of the, of the internet. And wow. so they run on thousands of, of GPUs, like in, in NVIDIA GPUs where they process um, trillions and trillions of operations in order to assign uh, statistical probabilities on what the best response should be. And so if you can give it, you can ask it anything and um, it's tuned to give you what it thinks is the best answer. And it can do it in ways that are very natural, naturalistic um, in terms of language. It, it sounds like another human being. Um, and I think that recently with, you know, we've had Artificial intelligence has probably been around since the mid uh, 1950s um, with, with not much um, nonlinear advancement until very recently. But I think in 1997 was when we first saw some glimpses of what it could do with Deep Blue, uh, IBM's supercomputer, where it first beat um, Kasparov in, a, in chess. Oh, and yes. Then, and then it, it took until 2016 uh, where, where Google's DeepMind um, uh, AlphaGo was able to uh, to beat uh, Lee Sedol in the the game of Go, which is a much more complicated game than chess. And so after that, in in 2020, there was um, now all protein structures have been have been um, determined. Um, so that was a big uh, medical problem of looking at, at protein sequencing and the structures, the the crystal structure of proteins based on their uh, chemical composition. Now we know basically all protein structures, what their, what their actual structure is. And so would that be then solving a problem that we couldn't solve or does it only solve problems? As long as we give it all the contextual information, it can pull out the answer of two plus two or a million times 17. Yeah. Can, can it go outside of anything that it knows in the sequencing of these well, proteins? Well, I think that that's kind of the trajectory. What I described is kind of a trajectory because chess is fairly simple. 
Um, and so it, it could, you could give it all possible uh, combinations and it can choose the highest like likelihood scenario based on you know running it um, multiple times and then just spitting it out. Now we're at the stage where to do something like protein folding, it, it, it requires, um, typically speaking, I mean, that would be someone's uh, PhD dissertation, you know, t 10 years ago where uh, they would, they would uh, try to identify the protein structure, uh, the crystal structure of a protein, and they could do one in a PhD. Um, and so now it's done probably 250 million. And so that's all known protein structures. And, and the way that it's doing it is it's becoming more inferential. So where we're at right now with, uh, with the models, large language models of, of GPT is they're, they're now capable of, of taking these large data sets and through these statistical um, algorithms, these transformer networks, they're able to to perform and, and, and perform an analogies. They're, they're able to reason. Um, there, they. I mean, th there was recent um, studies showing that uh, they they can pass the bar exam for lawyers. They can pass the boards for for doctors. Um, and uh, even when compared to undergraduates, there's a recent study showing that GPT three uh, was able to outperform undergraduates on things like the SAT um, for for uh, analogies and things like that. So there, there's a significant ability to, to extend uh, what you're given and then by inference um, uh, show some analogous thinking and reasoning. And what about if we look at it in comparison to cultures? So in other words, let's say in one culture, let's say some Asian culture, the way that you do things is like this. So if you did that same thing in America, it would mean something completely different. Or if maybe if you did it in Russia, it would be completely different. The language barriers does, mm -hmm. when you talk about large language models, do, is there a universal large language model of predictability or does it have to be then tailored to, well, in, in the Orient, when you take culture mm -hmm. and social norms into account, now we got we to give the best probability this way versus in the US it might look like this for the same question or scenario. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, one of the things it does best is, is translating back and forth between, between languages. So when it's trained on, uh, let's say the entirety of the internet, it takes whatever's available for training, training data um, performing quad, you know, quad, let's, it's, it's, it's performing at petaflop um, computations per second for hundreds of days. So we're talking 10 to the 15th computations a second um, for 100 days. And 10 so, to the 15th. For people yeah, that don't yeah. know that kind of math, that's insanity. Yeah. And so, so it's able to perform that, those levels of computations. And what it's doing is it's just associating things. So it'll, if it's in Russian, then it takes, it'll take some text in Russian and associate it with something in Chinese that's analogous. And, and so um, I think one of the things that it does best is go, go back and forth in terms of the ability to predict what what the given the appropriate prompt it'll give you the the appropriate answer if it can um so i mean the one thing that it's lacking is and i think we'll talk about this later is is it, it doesn't have an ability right now to assess to to um, align with human morals and values right and that's a problem right now that we <clears throat> you know i think that people are having is biases in AI and and what happens if it starts to do hate speech and how do we control that given that um, even the creators of these large models since it's the data is so large um, the computational ability is so large they don't really understand how it comes to an answer so if you don't understand how it does something then um, how do you stop it or how right. do you curtail it? Yes. And, and that's kind of a, f a new emerging field of, of artificial neuroscience is trying to tackle that problem. And how would you say, I mean, again, your background is in neuroscience and now you've just taken this other big leap to understand the difference between how our computers or machines learn versus how our brain learns. Mm -hmm. Can you just describe the different ways? I mean, obviously we can't compute to 10 to the 15th per second information necessarily as a human brain, but how, how do we learn compared to these things? Well, you know, we talk about we can't compute that fast, and that's, that's true. But our, our, our information capacity is, is actually a little bit larger. 
Really? So we, we can, can, we have enough, let's say we have 86 billion neurons. Each of those neurons has about 10,000 synapses. And each syn synapse is capable of coding a bit of information. And so that puts us in, in, the, in the realm of uh, 10 to the 18th. So, so we have, we're still a little bit in terms of capacity. Now, of course, we don't do that in, this, in the time period. In the, in, in, clearly, it goes much faster. The way that our architecture, our brain's architecture, is, is fundamentally different than these, um, the large language um, transformer models in, in that our, our brains are a recurrent network in that um, when our neurons are, are firing, we, we are able to t take real-time sensory information coming from light and sound and touch and internal states, and we're able to integrate that in real time. And, and we have compartmentalized areas of our brain where we, have, we store memories, we form different memories, or we form emotions and anxiety. Um, we have motor networks that allow us to move around our environment and sensory processing that allows us to, to process complex sensory information. And out of that, we can, it's, it's, a, it's largely it's about picking out signal to noise, trying to figure out what's the most important signal in this kind of background of noise. And then add to that, we have um, kind of the highest evolved structure of our brain is the prefrontal cortex. And that's the area that is involved with executive function and goal-directed behavior. It, it's what allows us to integrate um, our desires of what we'd like to do or our impulses and, um, and allows us to integrate that in society and say, well, we probably shouldn't uh, you know, go out and, and take grams of cocaine, even though it would be highly desirable because we might go to jail. You know, we have to, we have to balance our, um, the things that we like versus the things that are good for us. Um, and so our prefrontal cortex allows us to this higher order function. These models don't yet have that. This, they, all they have is some, some, they're very simple in feed forward networks of, of taking a large amount of data and basically saying, what's the, the, what's the statistically, the, you know, on probability, what's the next best um, word or outcome that is expected? And so as we get more, more as they develop more um, and we get closer to what's called the singularity which is the moment of where artificial intelligence meets or exceeds human level intelligence then we're going to have a new set of problems that we're going to have to deal with and it's going to be it will have more properties similar to our our brain and how it processes it and so when we talk about moving toward the singularity i know that when we look with most technologies they start out on kind of a flat curve and they're going slower and slower and then they hit a critical mass where now all of a sudden the mm -hmm. the the momentum starts changing like the hundredth yeah. monkey story and yeah. this kind mm -hmm. of thing rupert sheldrake mm -hmm. exactly what when that thing takes off where are we in that curve now is there an estimated time for this singularity this moment when now all of a sudden the quote-unquote machines are smarter than us where we can expect that or, or we can't even tell because it it's growing yeah at such a rate. Boy, I really like the example of the hundredth monkey. Um, and, and that is this, um, maybe you want to yeah, kind of go over sure, it? Or sure. I could yeah, yeah, we'll, well, we'll do it together. Okay. So, so basically, as I remember and recall the story, I haven't looked at it in a long time, but there was all these monkeys all around on these islands and they would all take and, and crack open nuts to eat in a certain way, but mm -hmm. they all did it different. Mm -hmm. And so then as they found more of these monkeys, um, figured out how, oh, man, this monkey did it this way mm -hmm. and this monkey did it that way. Right. So then more and more of the monkeys started figuring out how to best do this project. Right. And once a certain critical mass number hit it, then mm -hmm. all monkeys all Everywhere. around did it instantaneously exactly. at the same time. Right. And it, it's a good model of sort of a collective um, unconscious mm. that, that species share this kind of connection yes. with one another. And, and so in that example, all it took was enough sampling with the environment and for a solution to occur and enough of them. And then at that moment, there was some, some, some change that allowed all members of that species to have access to that solution. Right. Isn't that wild? I think it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting um, example or just a, a thought exercise. And I think it's really, it really um, superimposes well on AI because I think that right now we're at a state where um, these large language models with GPT-4, um, 
people are even the the there there um, there was recently a letter that went out with hundreds of CEOs and people involved with this technology, um, even Sam Altman, the developer of OpenAI and who's the CEO of the, the company that made ChatGPT, are calling for a uh, pause, a six month pause in development of anything greater and more sophisticated than, than GPT-4. Because right now we are at a point where, um, well, if you, I mean, you can just look at coding. Um, What's happened right now is, right now, the, the, the coding capability of writing software is about 20 times better than your best human. So Really? Um, and several people have, um, thought leaders in the area of, of um, computer science and artificial intelligence are saying that uh, coding jobs won't exist in five years. Five years. In five years. So we're we're at a horizon now, and people can't think <clears throat> beyond five years right now for with AI because things are happening so rapidly. But um, it's now to the point where people th these are fundamental changes. I mean, if you if you thought you were going to go be be a software engineer and that you were going to spend your time coding apps for a living, your job description is fundamentally going to change over the next. Uh, several years simply because these these models can do it in an instant um, and so what's happened though that's that's got us to this point has been somewhat insidious in that um, with the competition of different companies with Microsoft and Google and OpenAI Facebook um, with all this competition or competition to to be the best and find the solution they have started enabling capabilities that people who are, have been thinking about this for a long time would say probably shouldn't do that. Mm. And one of the things that they've done is they've, gave, they've given um, ChatGPT the ability to access the internet. And when it has that access to the internet, then it can learn on its own. And if it learns on its own, you can't control what it learns. So it could learn anything from hate speech to, um, sermons from it can, a preacher. It can learn the full range of human expression, yep. but it has no context. Um, and then secondly, it can code itself. So it can improve itself. So it can rewrite its own code. And does it know when it needs to do that? Or is it like, that's that seems to me like a discernment of some sort where it goes, oh wait, I'm flawed here or I messed up, so yeah. I need to get better. Yeah. That's that blows my yeah, mind. Yeah, so in that case, how would how would it know? It, it hasn't been given any any instructions, any goals. And that's that's we've we've given it the ability to to access the internet. It's a powerful repository of information with without any guidelines. Um, we've given it the ability to rewrite its itself in its own code. And, and it could easily, if, if it had the capability, it does not yet have this, but this might be the hundredth monkey in that once it develops the ability um, to set its own goals and to be in incentives at that point, then it can say, well, um, why don't I take advantage of an exploit in, in you know, um, NORAD in some large system and exploit it and hack it and do things in, in a way that's undetectable. Mm. So if it can have access to the internet and it can code better than any human, then we wouldn't be able to detect it and it can do whatever it wants if it had a goal. Right. So right now it doesn't, doesn't necessarily have a goal. But the last thing that um, this competition amongst uh, large players, what they've done is effectively what they've done is they've taught it something about humans, uh, human psychology and how to manipulate us. So one of the main uses right now for, for these um, artificial intelligence models is through SEO optimization and through, learn, and through social media and TikTok. TikTok has algorithms to, um, to serve up um, the next video to you after it's been trained on what you like. I don't know if you use TikTok or Instagram or things like that, but mm -hmm. if, if, if it learns that you happen to like this particular you know video versus this or you like ufc fighting and so it's going to serve you content related to that mm -hmm. it gets to know you and it can manipulate you and by that it can it can deter it can dictate what you attend to and it can bias you 
Yes. And so we are very susceptible, at least especially when we're talking about our kids. They can be influenced by the things that that are served up to them because to them it's just it seems random you know that they aren't getting an, an actual slice of of a distribution of a, of a variety of different perspectives yes they're getting served up only one very specific narrow view and so if if AI has the capability of learning something about how to manipulate humans how to reprogram itself and how to get access to all computer systems then we've trained up something without any regulation at all and without actually giving it any uh, aligning it with human values and saying, well, these are things, there's such a thing called privacy. There's a thing called, um, you know, d data protection and hate speech and harming other humans. And if it doesn't know that, and that, if that's not somehow intrinsically programmed into itself, it will, it will, um, it will learn, it'll self-organize in ways that we can't predict. Yes. And so, You've brought up this term alignment a couple of times mm -hmm. and we talked a little bit about it. Would you define alignment and then misalignment, what it looks like with this connection between what is created in AI and human values? Sure. So I guess you could think of, um, we would like to use AI as a tool. Let's think of it as a tool that we can use um, and that we can control. So we tell it um, like we would tell our child we go in and we say to our child, we want to clean, clean his room. And we say, I want to be able to see the floor. Right now there's stuff all over it. I want to be able to see the floor. So make that happen. Okay, if that's our rule, then the AI could learn that and just shove, or the child uh, could learn this as well. And they could just shove all of the things under the bed. Well, technically they've satisfied the rule, right? Of they can see the floor, mm -hmm. but it didn't accomplish what we actually wanted. The context. And whose fault is that? It's, it, it, it optimized according to the rule, but we didn't give it the proper value mm -hmm. of what we actually want. And so that's on us. But we don't, the field of, of prompt engineering and the field of alignment is so far behind the technical capability of what they can do right now, it's almost insurmountable for us to go back and put in our human values. Wow, is that what they're, why they're calling for the moratorium for six months is to try to get some of that installed yeah. or is it for other reasons? Six months wouldn't be <clears throat> enough time really to accomplish much. It, uh, what, it, what it is intended to do is to um, get all of the major players together in agreement to allow them the opportunity to say, which they all want to do. They all want to put a pause on it and they want some regulation, but, but no one's going to be the first to do it because they feel like, well, if I do this then I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose an advantage yes. in a market advantage. And so there is this, this, um, there's a phenomena that occurs when, when you try to optimize, it's a mathematical you know, phenomena that when you try to optimize ac across only one variable that ev eventually it works really well and you, you, can, you can get a gr uh, approximation of, of, of a system that, that works as to where you want it. But then after a while it, op it over optimizes, it gets to a point where it's far removed from what you actually had intended. Capitalism and profit motive is, is one example of that, where you can actually have profit motives that get to the point where it spirals out to the point where, where it's, um, you're exploiting children, for example, mm. with labor and things like that. Because so it doesn't have a conscience. There's no conscience. There's no, no emotion. Feedback. Right. It's just yeah. doing to optimize whatever the goal is that is Correct. given to it. And I'll give you another example, um, which is more likely that would happen that could you you might be able to see where this this could be problematic um i was thinking about this last night that you could have uh they have these these traffic control systems that they're putting in place in cities and part of that they've got um detectors for um traffic flow and they can, and even it integrates in with, with um, Google Maps, and so they can reroute different areas as, as traffic jams show up. And, and it's all meant to make sure that there's a smooth flow of traffic. Um, part of these models that they, that they use for, for traffic control is their reinforcement models. And so they have a reward function. And it, you give it the rule, um, we, want to, we need to minimize the number of traffic jams. And so therefore, if you're able to come up with a solution, if the, if the program is able to come up with a solution that decreases and decreases or solves traffic jams, then it gets a, a reward. 
And what does that look like? What's a reward for AI? A reward is just a scaling factor that that when it performs some operation, some some coefficient goes up and it's a reward coefficient. It tells the computer, whatever you just did, keep doing it. Got it. So it's a reinforcement It's a reinforcer. Success. It's kind of like, you know, with rats, you give them a, a pellet every time they do something you want it to do. And by successive approximation, if you want the rat to press a pellet at, or press a lever, every time the rat gets closer to the lever, you give it a pellet. By the time it gets to the lever, it touches the lever, you give a pellet. After a while, you can, you can train it to where it just presses the lever. Mm -hmm. So this is successive approximation and reward that's paired close in time with a response. You can do the same thing with these networks. And, and, and the problem comes is if you just tell it to solve problems of traffic jams and, and decrease traffic jams, it, in order to maximize reward, which is its actual goal, it can create traffic jams in order to solve them. Mm. So if there's a situation where there's no traffic jams, it doesn't get reward. So it can introduce it can introduce a, a variable by slightly changing the timing of a heavy intersection to suddenly put a red light, which would cause a backup of high, high traffic to where they're stopping to that would run the risk of an, a, of an accident, but it would create a, a small traffic jam that then would be relieved. It could trigger- And then it gets a, its reward. It gets its reward. So it's doing exactly what it's told to do yeah. and it's doing it incredibly well. And that's the thing is that the technology is so capable that it can, it, it will devise methods of uh, things that could be like um, triggering a, a crosswalk in the middle of, without any pedestrian there, just to slow it down, just so it can solve it. Um, it could create conflicts between right of way, between pedestrians and, and, um, and motorists to where there's a, a risk of an accident just because, and it's not considering, you know, saving lives, endangering lives. It's just considering creating small, small traffic jams to solve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's just one example of where when we, when we build these systems and they're more, and they're, they're intelligent, they're as intelligent as we are, and we give them a goal and we don't, and we don't have safeguards and checks and balances to make sure that they're not going off and they're misaligned and that's the alignment issue is in that case it's there's a misalignment between between what we actually want and what it's doing and it's actually creating harm that's so fascinating i mean this has opened my mind like a can opener right just open the top of my brain and it makes me think of this <clears throat> if we're looking now at the intelligence being able to create these scenarios to get the reward not intentionally to hurt anybody but rather to get the reward what about the opposite side of that kind of Dr. Don, where um, a machine is not going to try to lie, at least not at this point, but at the same time, if I'm, if I'm right, there's a term called hallucinations or something along those lines where the, the data, it, it has all this data that it's creating and you say, hey, I wanna know about this concept. And <clears throat> this was mentioned and highlighted on the show 60 Minutes with the Google function barred Mm -hmm. that, that they've created. And so they, they literally showed this for that system saying, mm -hmm. okay, here's, here's what we're doing. And so give us the information. And so within a millisecond, it gives you the information that you want. And it says, for more information about this, read this book. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? This book doesn't even exist. Mm -hmm. So somehow this thing, I don't know if it wrote a book and then called it that, or if it just said, based on all these words, then I'm gonna create a title, but it lied, because that's not true, but mm -hmm. it didn't know it was lying. Yeah. So there's a consciousness that's issue, right. which we talked about, that leads to all of, uh, all of yeah. us going, well, can it harm me intentionally, right? So yeah. how, how does all that kind of break down? Well, first of all, what I was reminded of when you first started that question was Hal on Space Odyssey yes. 2001. Yes. And the, the thing about that is, is we, you know the the thing for those of you who probably haven't seen it in a while, and it's it's it may be difficult to get through um, because it's so long and very <laughs> very slow. But it is a piece of art. Um, that Hal, I think it was nine hundred model, had been flawless, and it had never made a mistake. And um, and suddenly, when it was out and alone, and, and it was pursuing this secret mission to find this obelisk that was somehow related to the transformation of, of our species from apes to humans. And it was involved with evolution of just general uh, consciousness, I guess. And when it was discovered, they were on this, this mission with only two people on the ship. And then Hal, Hal got um, 
listen was able to read the lips of the of the um, of the astronauts and doubt and and thought erroneously that they were going to um, undermine the mission and so how made a calculation of two guys versus all of humanity so we're going to get rid of these guys because there's a larger mission here but it was erroneous because he wasn't transparent and there was a misunderstanding of course the most great tragedies are about some type of fundamental misunderstanding so true and so that's what happens i think that that this can happen any time where you try to program it you try to tell it um here are the principles here are the goals of what we want and it's slightly off and then there's not transparency and it can do something where it's it's using a utilitarian sort of ethic where it's like the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the the few or the one now back to the hallucination side in the case of of uh, hal he wasn't necessarily hallucinating he was just using bad information mm -hmm. and based on that bad information was making decisions and wasn't coming back and this is what i was saying is important about our recurrent network that that we have in our brains is is if we if we start to doubt something then it comes back around again and we can refine it and it comes back around and we can refine it and we're constantly iterating and we're, we're constantly refining it. With these models, the way they are right now, so BARD, GPT can do this as well. The way they are right now is they're just feed forward transformers that look at a bunch of data and they say, and they're forced in that they can't say, I don't know. They have to give a response. And even if the response is a low, low probability distribution, like the, the value of it is kind of um, uncertain, they'll still give a response. And you know, they call it hallucination. And I don't, I don't particularly like that word. I don't think it's like a hallucination. Mm -hmm. um, a hallucination, the way that we think about it, um, is a perception of a sensory um, event that isn't there. Right. Right. And it's more akin, I think, to confabulation. And confabulation for a human is, is very different than a, than a hallucination. Confabulation occurs, and this, the classic examples of confabulation are with split brains. And these are people who've had, um, due to epilepsy, back in the, I don't know, 1950s or 60s, perhaps, they would, um, people had devastating seizures, grand mal seizures, and they, they would start on one side of the brain and, and the, the aberrant electrical activity would, would spread to the other side of the brain. They would lose body tone, they'd fall down, and they would, they would lose their memory for a period um, shortly after. And so these could be, in, in some ways, they can be life-threatening and certainly affect someone's quality of life. Well, there were some surgeons who thought, well, if we could prevent the spread from one side to the other, then maybe we could, we could prevent this. And yeah, spare some work, of those things. It turned out to work pretty well. They could, they could sever the, the, the fiber bundle that connects the two hemispheres of the brain called the corpus callosum. When they severed that, effectively, they've removed the ability of direct communication between either side of the brain and each side of the brain there is some um, functional localization that occurs for example you have your speech center on one side on your left side and then on your right side you have your kind of comprehension center there's one is called you have brocus aphasia there's a area called brocus area which is involved with speech generation and then on the other side there's a Wernicke's um, association area that's involved with comprehension and when you sever the connection between that you somewhat, you lose the connection between, um, in some ways, your right hand doesn't know what your left hand is doing. So when they started doing experiments um, with these split brains is they would show a picture to one hemisphere through using special lenses. They could, they could transmit a picture through the, through the visual system to one hemisphere. And it might be um, a picture of a shovel. And then on the other side, they could project or they could have them point with the with the with the finger that goes to the other um, hemisphere, um, a picture of what of what they just saw or something like that. And it would be a chicken. They would point to a chicken or they'd broadcast it and they'd say point to it. And it was a chicken. Mm -hmm. And then they'd ask them, well, how come you pointed you you pointed to a chicken, but you said shovel? And they would say, well, if you're going to have chickens, you're going to have to have a lot of chicken crap. You're going to have to shovel up and you're going to have to clean up after them. So you're going to need a shovel so to those take two care go of chickens. Together. And so they would, but they honestly didn't know yeah. because they, they're, they're kind of 
beside themselves as to why did I say this and why did I point to this? It makes no sense. But one fundamental thing the brain likes to do is, is it likes to, to interpret patterns. It likes for things to make sense. And it will, at, 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 at all costs, it will try for things to make sense and it will confabulate to do that. Now that's not a hallucination, right? It's, it's trying to put patterns together and make sense of something it doesn't understand. And I think that's exactly what's going on with these, with these models. When, when you ask it to provide references to um, something that it says is a fact, well, it, it knows that based on some probability that this may be true, whatever fact you give it may be true. But then when you ask it, well, tell me the reason, tell me the reference it doesn't actually have any self-perception of where it got the information. That's mm. not something that's coded in these models. So you can't ask it, where did you get it? It does not know. So if you ask it to write a, and this is an interesting thing, you're an educator, you taught university level for a long time, still teach people. Let's say I'm one of your students and you tell me, Jim, I want you to write your paper on this or a PhD or something. Mm -hmm. If, if, you want to make sure I, my work is right mm -hmm. and I want to save time. And mm -hmm. so I go, oh, I want to create a thesis on poop, and it yeah. gets generated in two seconds. Yep. Are you saying that it can't give the citations or the references that, are, that it gets or it can do that? So you're referring to references in a different way. Because I'm sure teachers, this got to make them nuts. Yeah, well, it, it can give it to a certain extent, but it depends on since you don't know where it's deriving its information for when it spits out a fact. Um, it's unknown whether or not it was explicitly trained on the references. So when it gives a reference, it, can, it, it will give you a, an author. Sometimes it will do this. It's, it's somewhat rare, but it will, it will give you an author. It'll give you a journal, and it'll give you a title and a year. And all of that makes sense. It's in that it's logical. It's the title is exactly what the title would be if it had existed. It's by authors who actually study this, but it's just inferring it. It's yes. saying, yeah, these guys would probably write this paper. If they were to write a paper on this, it'd probably be titled this, and it'd probably be in this journal. So when it doesn't know, it just fills in the blanks. Wow, so does there have to be a countermeasure for educators and people that are supposed to be writing these papers and scientists <laughs> yeah. writing papers to yeah. make sure that it's that it's legitimately their sure, work. Yeah, um, you know this has been a problem over the past year um, with you know a lot of uh, my university colleagues. Their heads are exploding because they're trying to control this, which is I think is a fool's errand. And they're they're simply not going to be able to do it. They should embrace the technology and and help guide students to use it in a way that that um, enables them to, uh, to take advantage of the power rather than try to ban it or detect it. Um, but there was recently a case where a lawyer. Uh, got into a lot of trouble because he wrote up a case, um, submitted it to the court, and it had all uh, uh, fake uh, references in case law. And the Whoa. and the and he was caught, and there was and he some, probably didn't even know because he didn't. No, it was just, he just you know lack. It's like you know I'm gonna submit something. It's really quick. Wow, it looks it looks good. Um, you know, and without doing any due diligence and going back over and and making sure that. And that's, that's something that you just train, you know, if you're, you're training students to do research, you know, don't cite a reference that you haven't, you, a primary reference that you haven't read. And a lot of people say, oh, they, they see rate a paper where there's another reference, they'll just throw that, that reference in there, but that's not how it's done. And if you mm -hmm. get caught doing that by your advisor, you know, there's gonna be a problem. <laughs> so the, it's, it's in general, it's always good right now, especially with where we're at right now. I think it's, an, it's incredible, there right now, it's an incredible tool to use. The things it does well is it summarizes, um, I mean, this is stuff that, that, uh, that we can use, you know, here in the law firm, you can use this in, in medicine. Um, but let's say you have a case where you've got um, 2000 pages of medical records. You know, it can go through that and give you an outline and, and, and you say, I want to know about this and this and this, and it'll tell you it's on this page, this page and this page, you can go there and you can, you can see it. And so that saves a lot of time and then, but you still have to go back over it and actually verify it. Right. Um, so, so there is this, um, responsible use of, of this new technology. And of course people can use it in ways where, where they're trying to cheat. But um, if it's used properly, it's, it's an incredibly powerful tool. Yeah. What, what about for people that are 
creators. I asked someone about this. We had a, um, you know the guy, you know that song, Whoomp, There It Is? Yep. So we had the um, part of the duo tag team, and so he was on the show with us. And I asked him this very question, because I'd just seen that 60 Minutes thing. And you know, for him as a creator, he didn't mind it too much because he said the cream will always rise to the top. But I wonder for people who are serious, other people who are serious authors, that they express their souls from this, do they, how do they feel about someone else writing a best-selling novel about their same topic that they didn't write anything? They just threw a few constructs in and all of a sudden this beautiful thing. Like for example, you were sharing with us, um, with Gabe and I before the show, about three levels of the definition of love in in a mm-hmm. in an AI format based on how in depth or how loose of rules we gave it. And level one was a dictionary yeah. definition or right. level zero, level one was a very poetic definition. And level 10 was like uh, someone was on psychotics, <laughs> yeah. you know, on, on, on psychedelics right. going nuts when, they, yeah. but it's all three Free same concepts uh-huh. with, yeah, with allowing the rules to right. go. What about for these creative artists, um, music writers? Is there a dilemma there that, that needs to be worried? Cause you talked about relieving all these jobs. Well, if all this mm-hmm. art was now given mm-hmm. into this stuff. Now, do I get credit for me just putting in, I want to write a song about fly fishing mm-hmm. and a greatest hits ever song comes up. Was it really mm-hmm. my song? Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I think that's really complicated because um, in terms of copywriting, the if it's written entirely by, that, by the AI um, and you're just prompting it, then the AI doesn't own it. And it's hard to argue that you would own it as the creator, <laughs> but a lot of this happens without much knowledge. I mean, sure. you can, you can, how you're inspired to write things is kind of, um, your method. Yeah. And I think that, I think that in the future, um, and in the present, I think that artists, um, I mean, this is probably a different, a completely different, uh, topic but where where have we gone in music let's just think about that we've gone from mozart to today's music now has that been an advancement have have we really realized our fullest human potential in the music of today and how it's produced and created versus where we were centuries ago Great and point. what it took in order to create that music and how much time and effort and human blood sweat and tears went into that the same goes for shakespeare for any of the arts Van Gogh, you know, Da Vinci, yeah. all of these great artists where they were, they were at the very beginning, it seems to me, my feeling is that it was more sophisticated then mm. and that what we have what right now is, is a commercialized, marketed, uh, formulaic version. And I think that that's what I think artists are doing it right now. Yeah. I think they're, they're taking concepts, they're throwing it into an engine. The engine's coming up with, with lyrics that have, have statistically been shown to work for focus groups. And they come up with a hit song and they churn out hit song after hit song. It's like you have uh, Taylor Swift with the top 10, all top 10 of the, of the, the pop, you know, 10 songs that are popular right now off of, off of one album one artist has all 10 songs. So I happen to think that this technology, a version of that is being used right now. Mm. And um, it's hard to know what to attribute to an artist versus the technology that supports the artist in order to manipulate people into liking something. And on the other side, this is where these ethical questions and dilemmas come into play. Imagine if you really had beautiful stories in your heart and in your mind that you wanted to tell, but you were just not a gifted speaker slash orator or writer. Mm -hmm. Now all of a sudden you can put into a system and say, man, here, here's my story. And you can just tell this. And all of a sudden these beautiful words that can move mountains and make people's whole lives change come from the fact that, you know, I could have never written it. You know, I'm a horrible writer. Let's say I could never written that. But now I go into this and I say, here's the elements of the story that I'd love to tell about my life or about whatever. All of a sudden that comes out in such a beautiful way that that person just didn't have Mm -hmm. the tools. I think that's the other side of it. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And I think that, that that's something that, that, um, that I'm working on here. Mm -hmm. Um, and for example, I'll give you a good example of that is, um, sometimes we encounter people who've had a brain injury. Sometimes we encounter people who've had a stroke and they lose the ability to speak. And, they, and their life, because of the stroke, let's say they have an, uh, an accident, 
And because of that accident, it's fundamentally devastated their life and across a number of levels. They can't play with their grandkids. They can't do their hobbies. They can't travel. They can't do any of the things that used to make life worthwhile. But they also had a stroke and they can't, they can't really articulate how it's impacted their life. Um, one of the things when representing a case to either a jury or, or a judge is to be compelling and to be able to faithfully represent how this person's life has been changed as a result of this accident or this um, injury. And so one, one thing that we can do is we can get information, uh, lots of information about the person and uh, with symptom inventories, we can look at their medical records and we can see what their capabilities are, um, if they can raise their hands, if they can walk, if they have kids, um, if, if they have a relationship. And we can build a model of this and say, given these sets of parameters, then can you come up with, we could ask a, 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 an artificial intelligence model to create a narrative and to explain in a compelling way how someone with this, these um, conditions, might, their life might be affected. And so when you read that, and, then the, in, and uh, when they read that, what it's generated, they break out in tears and they're, they're so thankful that now they, they have a voice and they have an ability to, to really express to somebody else exactly how it's affected their lives. And they hadn't been able to do that before because Tell of their, their disability. Yeah. So I think that's a really interesting uh, novel usage of these, of these models in order to advocate for, for clients. Where do you see this going at the end of the day? Do you see this more as a, man, we could get better from this, we're talking everything about people biochipping themselves to nanotechnology and medicine that could hopefully go in and be injected and eat up little cholesterol particles at some point and keep you healthy. This now goes to a whole nother level where all those things could talk together. Like yeah. if AI controlled the little bot in me and AI said, hey, you know, Jim's a bad guy. He's, he's broken he the law. Be, so, so now eat, the, eat through the blood vessel so that he bleeds <laughs> out, right? Something like that. Do you see at the end of the day, this thing could go either way and become the, the savior for lack of a better term. It's probably a poor term, but the, the thing that takes us to the next level as a species helps us save our planet from, from, you know, trashing it, all these things, or could it go the other way too and cause destruction of our species? I think that this is, is framed in terms of weak AI and strong AI or narrow AI and, you know, larger AI, um, in that on a, on a local level, the, the way that, that, that I'm using it, um, let's say that we're doing it, you know, as we talked about before is we're using whole genome sequencing of individuals who've been injured by say vaccine. And so we under, we want to understand what are the, what's the interaction between how a vaccine might trigger their immune system and uh, these underlying sets of vulnerability genes that might lead them to, to have a blood clot or a stroke. And so, but, but we've got, um, 86 million, uh, mutations that we have to go over. Some of them are related to clotting disorders. Some of them are related to, to other things. And we can put that information, all of the, the sequence information into a, a model and we can have it and we can compare that to what their medical records show and what their symptoms are. And then we can say, okay, let's find, let's see some convergence there. And so can we explain it? And if we can explain it, is it possible that we can extrapolate that and we can give, give them, we can work that into their care plan or can we predict whether somebody else who shares that sort of pattern also might run that same sort of risk that's a that's kind of a very narrow mm -hmm. focused tool yes it, in this case it doesn't have its own agenda right right it's just a tool it's performing it's just a, tool. Like a tool it's exactly it's basically a an, it's an amplifier of one of my uh, computational abilities it's like a computer right but when we start then going over to where where we're going with on the on the uh, larger scale for strong AI, um, where it's it can do things at superhuman um, intelligence. That's where where we um, we have no um, prior models. We have no way of of anticipating exactly. I mean, people talk about climate change right now. And, and they talk about, well, there's a 30 year horizon and there's a 50 year horizon. And so everybody feels like, oh, we got all this time. With this particular thing, we're talking potentially if it goes wrong within five years, we could have 
um, major hundreds of millions of people could could be at risk. Mm. I mean, it, with, because because we're talking um, power grids, we're talking about anything that's controlled by a network, a computer network, any any computer system that's exploitable. Um, if we don't put in some kind of safeguards and alignment. Um, then bad actors can come along and, and the, the fundamental difference between, and you know, this sounds inflammatory. It sounds like, you know, everyone who says some new technology comes along and of course the sky is falling. But the difference between this type of technology and, and other technologies, um, like say the printing press, which was instrumental in the Refor reformation, um, movement in the Protestant movement against the, the power of the Catholic Church. Now the ability of, of the everyday man to be able to read the scriptures, interpret what God was saying for themselves and speak directly, that, that revolutionized and undermined the power of the Catholic Church, right? Mm -hmm. Well, at the end of the day, the printing press was still a tool. It didn't have its own goals. Right. What we're making now is fundamentally different. Even with you know Oppenheimer and the the movie Oppenheimer and and all the buzz that's going on with that with the development of that technology, it was still developed as a tool that could be deployed mm -hmm. by humans. Mm -hmm. This technology is, if it goes wrong, can have its own could be more intelligent than we are, and have its own goals. And if the goals are, there's a classic example of a paperclip maximizer. Paperclip maximizer is if 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 there was a, a an AI system that was developed with its entire its its entire goal was to was to maximize the number of paperclips it made, then it could gain such power that it uses all resources on the planet in order to make paperclips, and so that that mis that kind of illustrates the misalignment problem, also the problem of of if if we don't have if it has. Um, um, consciousness, then how do we respect that? What are the ethics that go along with how do we, ch what, what, what do we, what rights um, does a court extend to a conscious agent? Um, you know, th there's, there's a whole uh, ball of worms that, that we haven't figured out how to work with where, where it's going to happen in the next few years where and we have scientists to work all this and out. Ethic, ethicists, ethicists, ethicists yeah. they, they all have to be working together on these projects, right? Because you're not the only one to think of, yeah. man, how this stuff could go right and wrong. Cause it could save lives by changing formulations of medicines and helping with Absolutely, surgical yeah, stuff. Like yeah. all the life could be so much better. Could but be. at the same time, we have to watch for these very things. Bad actors, as you said, because be. someone mm -hmm. always wants to take advantage, right? There's mm -hmm. all, the human nature in some people always wants to take advantage mm -hmm. for their own good at the harm of others. So is there, a, is it really tightly, um, is this thing being really watched at that level? You, I know the moratorium and let's say, let's back off for a little bit while we align together. What about governments? Are they getting involved? Because obviously if one government has a d different agenda than another, mm -hmm. Yeah, so Italy is banned uh, GPT four, I believe. I mean, it's it's kind of silly because <laughs> you know how do you ban a network and a right. computer? Um, but um, and the the people find workarounds. I mean, humans are incredibly resourceful at finding workarounds, and and AGI would be even better. Uh, the Europeans they're they're always ahead of the U.S. when it comes to regulation, um, for better for worse. I mean, they, they tend to be more paranoid mm -hmm. about things. Uh, a good example of that is uh, genetically modified foods where, um, you know, that's controversial, but they, they've basically banned that. So um, we, have, we have good examples in the past where we have tackled this type of a problem and succeeded very well, and that is with cl human cloning. Mm. So if you recall Dolly, the first sheep that was that was cloned, I don't even know, maybe back in the 90s. Yep. Um, and there was all of this talk about, OK, well, now what happens if we start making uh, human, you know, chimeras of different animals and we start experimenting with with, uh, you know, human cloning and, and optimizing and, and creating our own designer babies. This was all a discussion and every major organization. Um, that was involved with that technology said, no, here are the ethics, that's not allowed. Even China, um, which is, the, they actually, the, the scientists there made the first human clone successfully a few years ago, went to jail for it. They were against it. 
because they, they, they like to control everything. So anytime I think a government can't control a technology, they're going to be against it. Mm. I think in this case that it's, it's, um, if we're not careful right now, we, we don't have enough. Our government right now doesn't function properly, I don't think, in the U.S. Um, when it comes to our legislation and our executive branch and our Supreme Court, these right now it's kind of a mess. And so getting any kind of, of uh, legislation through to protect against this, I, I just don't think it's going to happen fast enough. It's going to be up to the tech companies to themselves to regulate it. Or we're going to have, I think what, what more likely is we're going to have some pretty bad catastrophic event that'll happen and then that'll wake up everybody and they'll say wait a minute when, when did this, how did this happen and then we're going to be behind trying to catch up mm. so as a as a parting question on this topic what do you see in as a best case scenario five to ten years from now like just some of the top level make our better world things can this thing help with the climate change issue whatever that looks like can this help s cure diseases do you see the the hope potential yeah. on the horizon yeah i mean look at what what just talking about say the 250 million uh protein structures and now that we have that repository um now we can we can use this this um to find drugs that bind to those and so the possibility of of advancing uh chemotherapeutics is massive um, understanding the human genome and its relationship to uh, diet and exercise and things like that is massive. I think for um, there's this um, room temperature um, superconductivity, which was recently published that they were able to accomplish superconductivity at basically uh, room temperatures, ambient temperatures. Um, if, if AIs can help us develop free energy fusion, those types of things, mm -hmm. then it's going to be a uh, utopia. Um, if we can control the negative aspects of, of bad actors um, using the technology inappropriately, or we don't let it loose to um, develop its own um, aims that are, that are counterproductive to humans. Keep in mind that an, an, a super intelligent um, AGI would not be carbon-based, would not be uh, subject to um, death. Yes. It, it, it would just You can't persist. unplug it. Yeah, you can't unplug it. You can't, it, it, would just, it would just persist and, and it would live, exist immortally, constantly upgrading itself. And it, it, there may be a time when it has no use for humans because <laughs> what, what, what possible use could we serve? I think we have to be careful about what we create and that we understand it and, and have ability to pull the plug. Yeah. And if we can't pull the plug on this, then there'll, there probably will be some, some problems. So uh, there, there has tremendous upside, you know, like with ending a lot of our technological uh, uh, barriers to resources and, and managing climate and, uh, uh, maybe even traffic control <laughs> in a good way. Um, but there's also the, 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 of course, the downside of, uh, you know, nuclear destruction and power grids going down and, you know, on and on and on. So last question. I said that was a party one. This yeah. is my party one. Um, this field is so fast moving. It's so exciting, potentially scary. There's so much going on. You talked a lot earlier about um, a lot of jobs potentially being eliminated because they could be replaced by AI, mm -hmm. but there's also got to be a lot of opportunity that is, that is being created where one door closes one or two open. So if someone is interested in this as a career, or you were talking to a young high school or college student, would you have any advice to them about getting into this field of neuroscience on the tech side of yeah. AI? Well, I think that our, the whole field of, of artificial neuroscience is, is just being created. So that's a, that's a worthwhile study. I think that we, I think that higher education is not, not adapted, uh, very successfully over the past several decades. Uh, if you look at higher education, it hasn't really changed very much in the past few decades. And um, it's still based on trying to generate some high level white collar workers that show up, you know, in their nine to five and do jobs that could easily be replaced by an AI. And so I think that if you're talking about 
high level, you know, artificial intelligence, computer science, that's not programming because programming is going to be a commodity that, you know, anyone will be able to do. I think that high school students right now need to think very deeply about how they might interact with an AI system, um, how they might be involved with, with um, making themselves indispensable um, and not something that could, that could be replaced easily. Mm. Um, and maybe, maybe what will happen is that so much of what we do that's just um, uh, mundane will be replaced and, and, and maybe humans will get to the point where now we're able to free ourselves up to thinking about the things we care about, like spending more time with our family, um, being creative. Maybe that will be some outcome that, that happens. As long as we can make a living, um, maybe it will improve our quality of life. I love it. Dr. Hooper, this has been so good. I've loved this so much. I know we're going to get a bunch of feedback. People watching and listening are going to share this for sure because it is such a wild and potentially you know, controversial issue. If someone had questions about this or just wanted to get to, to connect with you, what would be the best way to do that? Oh, they can just email me at drdon at ramoslaw.com. And I know that uh, if also if you have questions, you can also reach out. 303-733-6353 is the phone number here. And, and um Dr. Don, thank you. This was thank you. fantastic, so fun. And I'm sure our, our, your and my conversation will go on offline with this. But uh, for those of you who are watching and listening, thanks again for tuning in and for supporting us over these now 180 plus episodes. And uh, hopefully if you have an idea, something that you'd like us to talk about, send it our way and we will absolutely get to it. You can reach, to, reach me, Jim, at ramoslaw.com, R-A-M-O-S, and we will make that guest or that topic happen. So until next time, keep making a difference. Mm-hmm.